Recently, I was made aware of someone, I won't mention the name, uh, that uh, made a statement that uh, Ruckman teaches the way that they do and um, showed the Romans commentary. Well, it just so happens that uh, I also have a Romans commentary. And uh, what I'm going to do here today, uh, since the certain someone uh, claimed to show the thing, but uh, actually just only showed a few little highlighted parts here and there. I'm not going to mention any names, of course. We don't do that here or anything like that. Um, but I'm going to show you. We're actually going to go through the whole thing where he talks about Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Okay, right here it is, the Romans commentary. All right, I'm going to show it with the overhead camera here. Here we have, actually it starts with verse 8. I'll just show you here really quickly, page 398, Bible Believer's Commentary. There you go. There it is. All right. Verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, now let's actually go through this. We're going to read everything from here till he starts to discuss verse 14. If you are going to get saved... You are going to have to believe the word of faith which we preach. Moreover, that word isn't far off so that you have to work to get it. The scriptures say, The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. You know, lining up with what's going on in here. So if a fellow wants to know what the Lord says, he can have access to it. And if a man wants to be saved, the word of faith is right at the two places that enable him to trust Christ. The heart and the mouth. You see verses 9 and 10 there in this chapter. God will make sure that any man who really wants to know how to be saved will get the word. Now, if you use the Romans road to lead someone to Christ, then verses 9, 10, and 13 are the point where you tell that the sinner exactly how to be saved. A man is saved when he believes the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, you can read that, um, where the gospel is defined. In Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13, Paul explains how to believe the gospel. Okay, that's exactly what I've been saying. The first thing is to confess Jesus Christ. When you confess something, you admit or declare that it is so. When a man gets saved, he will confess Christ as the only way that he can get to heaven. He will confess that Jesus Christ died for his sins. He will confess to God that he is trusting Christ alone for salvation. Many gospel tracts quote 1 John 1, 9 as part of the plan of salvation. They equate the confession of sins mentioned in that verse with the repentance that should occur when a sinner trusts Christ as Savior. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Repentance toward God and faith uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Talks about it. You can look that one up. Yes, a man must realize that he is a sinner and under the judgment of God. There is no way that a man can trust Christ without admitting that it, that is so. Exactly. That's what I've been saying for years and years and years. But when, but when a man gets saved, he doesn't need to confess every sin he has committed to get saved. Exactly. Exactly. I've never preached this thing. This is what Jack Hiles would always say. You have to confess every sin. That's not what it's about. Let's continue. Repentance before salvation is a turning from a state of being. Before salvation, you are a sinner under the wrath of God. At salvation, you turn from that state of sin to receive Jesus Christ and become a son of God. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Acts 26, verse 18. You are then obligated to do works meet for repentance. Notice he says obligated. Okay? After salvation, you should, have, you should live for Jesus Christ and show others that you have repented and have been saved. Okay? Just stop there for a minute. Okay? Um, this is, I've been called a heretic for saying these same things. And all Denlinger's making his own gospel up and stuff like this. Okay? I get it from one of the best teachers out there. Right, ever. And it's what the Bible teaches. There are places I disagree with Ruckman. 
So I'm not some kind of, I, I say I'm a Ruckmanite in jest, you know, to get the funny bunnies worked up. But I disagree with Ruckman in a couple areas. Does that mean I throw him out? Of course not. He's a, you know, I've, I really believe one of the best Bible teachers that, that ever lived. How do I know that? Because I've compared what he teaches with the scriptures. And in practical application of learning how things go, going door to door and witnessing and things like that to people. I've seen this stuff. But let's continue. And you do have to have a changed life. That's, I mean, just common sense. Confession of sins is different, though. After salvation, when you sin, you should still repent. Sam Jones said that regeneration is only mentioned twice in the Bible, but repentance is mentioned more than 100 times. Repentance is incumbent on everyone, whether they are saved or not. But repentance after salvation is different from repentance before salvation. Technically speaking, after salvation, if you are saved, you are no longer a sinner. You are a saint who commits sin. Very true. There is a difference. As a saint, you do not uh, repent to receive Christ. You are already in Christ, and you are no longer under the wrath of God. After salvation, you turn from your sin to the service of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. But having sinned, you have also broken your fellowship with God. To restore that fellowship, you must go to the Lord and tell him exactly what you have done that was wrong, the individual acts. So you are not repenting of being in sin because no saved person lives in sin. See comments under Romans 8, 8. A saved person lives in Christ. You are repenting of committing sin. And to do that... You must confess it. So 1 John 1, 9 has nothing to do with salvation at all. And to use it to get a sinner to repent will only confuse him when he gets saved and finds out that he still must confess his sins. Okay. Um, you know, let me just, again, let me just pause here for a minute. Okay. And explain a little bit more. First of all, let me just say this. I know that some idiot's going to watch this video and they're going to go, oh, he's overcomplicating salvation. No, he's explaining. It's a commentary on scripture. Right? This is not a gospel presentation. He's explaining what's going on when somebody gets saved in the process and everything else. So don't say, oh, he's overcomplicating. Just go watch something else. Go watch Anderson or some other idiot that doesn't know the Bible. You know, I said I wasn't going to name names, but you know, I won't name anybody else because I don't want to... Anyways. <laughs> okay. But secondly, the thing I need to say is that what he's trying to say here is when you get saved, your relationship changes. Okay, I had a sister write to me recently and talk about Romans chapter 3, verse 25, talking about remission of sins past. And she said, does that mean at salvation you're only forgiven for your sins past? I said, well, in the sense of, you know, you're forgiven for your sins past when you get saved because your relationship changes at salvation. Your relationship to God changes, right? You have a new thing there. I mean, if you're lost and you're confessing sins to God, it doesn't mean a thing. Okay, you have to get saved. And then when you get, sin after that, and you will sin after that, and you mess up, then you come and you say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up there and whatever else. And if you don't confess those sins, he's going to punish you as a father would punish his child. Okay, but he's not going to send you to hell. See, that's what's going on here. But let me continue. Okay, now before going on, let's get this matter so that it is very clear. A lost man can confess his sins to God or even to Jesus Christ all he wants, and he will go to hell. Judas did, there in Matthew. Balaam did, Numbers 22, verse 34. Pharaoh did, Exodus chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. Every one of them confessed that he was a sinner and confessed his sin, and every one of them ended up in hell after he did it. Confession of sins isn't salvation. Before I was saved, I took Catholic convert courses from my father, Sullivan, at St. Michael's on Palifax Street in downtown Pensacola. During that time, I was a good Catholic. I was tithing before I was saved. I kept the ashes on my forehead all day long on Ash Wednesday, and I took the palm leaf home and hung it up on Palm Sunday. I attended Mass. I prayed the rosary. I gave, even gave up beer and whiskey for Lent. I also went to confession on a regular basis. But then one night, the Holy Spirit cornered me and let me know in no uncertain terms that I was going to hell. Confessing your sins to a priest won't save you. Exactly. Catholics, though, aren't the only ones that have this, that problem. I've talked to many a Southerner who, when asked if he was saved, replied, My, oh my, yes. Dr. Ruckman, I ask the Lord to forgive my sins every night. <laughs> well, if, that was, if that's what you are counting on to get you to heaven, you are as lost as a goose in a horse race. Confessing your sins won't save you. 
Anything short of a man turning to Jesus Christ for salvation and confessing Him as Lord and Savior is not salvation. Confessing your sins may be halfway, but it, fall, it still falls short. It's a good thing to confess your sins, in other words, but that won't save you. Jesus died on the cross for sinners. Uh, page 402. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou shalt be saved. Confessing your sins has nothing to do with it. The next thing is to, to getting saved is to believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. The resurrection makes the atonement efficacious to a sinner. Efficacious means to, be, to make effective, um, to bring about a change. The, re the resurrection makes the atonement effective to us. It brings a change in our lives. If all Christ did was to die for sin, then you could not apply the atonement to yourself. Paul said, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Without the resurrection, the best for which you could hope would be Abraham's bosom. You would never make it to heaven, because there's no perfect sacrifice. In other words, is what he's saying there. If Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, then he would have been proved to be a man like any other man. Romans 1, 4. If Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, then you could not be justified completely before God. Without the resurrection, Romans 4.25 there, without the resurrection, you could lose whatever salvation you had gotten, Acts 13, verse 34. Uh, and again, you know, these are all scriptural references here to, you know, you go here and it's lining up with what he's saying up here, if you don't understand that. If there was no resurrection, then you have no new man, Romans 6.4, you could not be born again. So there are no ifs, ends, or buts about it. If a man confesses Jesus Christ with his mouth and believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ in his heart, the promise is, thou shalt be saved. That is how you believe the gospel. That is all there is to it. But how do you believe in your heart? What is a heart belief? He says in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. How can you tell that you are believing with your heart and not your head? You can tell that you are believing with your heart when you rely on a thing. You trust it. You lean on it. That is your heart belief. I can in intellectually assent to the fact that my car will get me to the airport to catch my flight to my next meeting, but I don't believe it in my heart until I get in my car and drive it to the airport. Very well said. A man can agree that all the facts of the gospel are so. He can repeat with complete sincerity the Apostles' Creed every Sunday, and he will still wind up in hell. Belief of the head is knowing about Christ. Belief of the heart is trusting in Christ. You are relying on Jesus Christ to keep you out of hell. That is a heart belief. Religion is reliance. The question for the sinner is, what are you relying on to keep you out of hell? That is a lot, of, that is a lot different from asking a fellow, do you believe in Christ? An unsaved person can say that he believes in Christ, and he truly does, and still be relying on his good works to get him to heaven. I was witnessing to a Catholic friend of mine one time. I asked him, you believe that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again, don't you? He said, sure, I believe all that. I then asked him, then who did Christ die for? Well, he said, he died for everybody. I know that, I said, but who specifically did Christ die for? Again, he replied, he died for the sins of the whole world. He died for everybody. Can you tell me one sinner he died for? I asked. I don't know what you mean, he said. I said, can you give me the name of one sinner for whom Christ died? No, he replied rather flustered. Can you? Sure I can, I said, Peter S. Ruckman. Now do you know what the difference was between that fellow and me? That poor deluded Catholic had learned why Christ died, but he never applied it to himself. And that's the state of most Catholics, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Methodists, and even some Baptists. A lot of Baptists today. <laughs> they know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, they believe he died for sins and that he rose again, but they never have appropriated the sacrifice for themselves. I, on the other hand, knew a good thing when I saw it. Jesus Christ died for me. If he didn't die for you, then that's too bad. But I know he died for me. When I finally heard that he paid for my sins, and that all I had to do was receive his righteousness as a free gift, I took it, brother. You didn't have to tell me twice. I received him as if I were the only sinner for whom he died. It wasn't anything intellectual. It was completely personal. I wanted him to be mine. It's like the old uh, little song that's saying, you know, my beloved is mine, and, or I am his and he is mine. I've, his banner over me is love. Can't think how it goes right now. This reminded me of that right there. When the Bible says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, verse 10, that's what it means. You go beyond the bare facts of the gospel and make them yours personally so that you are totally relying on what Jesus Christ did for you to get to heaven and out of hell. 
verse 10, And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. The heart and the mouth spiritually are connected. You talk about the things you love. Jesus continued on in Matthew 12, 35 to say, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. Now there are two things that come up at this point. The first is the place of prayer in salvation. It is obvious that the mere act of praying itself saves no one. In Luke 18, verses 10 through 14, two men go to pray at the temple, and that story ends with one man saved and the other man lost. Cornelius prayed on a regular basis, and God answered his prayers, Acts 10, 2, Acts 10, 4. But Cornelius did not get saved until he heard Peter preach, Acts 10, verses 34 through 43. And he believed on Christ, Acts 10, verses 43 through 47. So prayer in and of itself doesn't save a man. All right? Let me just show you the practical application of this. Right here, chick track. Okay? Back here, what to pray. Dear God, I am a sinner in need forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ shed his precious blood and died for my sin. I am willing to turn from my sin. I now invite Christ to come into my heart as my personal Savior. Okay? Sinner's prayer right there on the back. Now, this is where a lot of the contention comes in. They'll say, well, see, that prayer can't save you. Well, when Ruckman says, and, you know, and then you know, certain individuals will say, they'll use that quote there, and then they'll skip ahead, and they won't read the context around it. What Ruckman is condemning there is not somebody praying for salvation. Obviously, that's in the context there. The publican, when he prays, God be merciful to me, a sinner, he gets saved. Right? So the prayer isn't the issue. It's what is in the heart, okay? That's what's going on there. It's not that, well, then you don't have to pray or something like this, all right? And just to prove that point, if you get somebody going out door to door and they say, would you like to go to heaven? They do a little fancy gospel, you know, can I take five minutes and show you how to get to heaven when you die? You know, I can show you, blah, blah, blah. And, and these Baptists, they just go and they high pressure. Jack Hiles mainly is the one that, that was into this whole thing. Quick prayerism and the whole easy believism thing carried out today by Stephen Anderson and his cult following. Um, but these guys will go out and they'll they'll force people into this prayer through guilt tripping and whatever else. Just you know, they're on the front porch there and the, looking in your house and the, and the knocking on your door and things. And the people are just like, oh, just I, okay, what do I got to do to get you off my porch? Pray this prayer, and they'll lead them in some kind of a little prayer like that. Of course. You know, Andrew Snake doesn't believe in gospel tracting, but you see my point. They'll do this little sinner's prayer thing, gospel presentation, and then the person goes, okay, you know, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, you know. And they, oh, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. You know, you know, and, they, and they repeat the prayer. They don't mean it for one minute. They don't mean it at all. So the prayer, just because somebody says those words that I showed you there, that's not going to save them. Now, if you have somebody that's at the end of themselves and they're, they're broken, contrite spirit, and they're going, you know, and they, they see something like that, and, they, and tears running down their face, and they're going, God, please save me, and things. God's going to save them, all right? Don't let anybody tell you, you know, that, uh, oh, the, the prayer is going to damn you to hell, and things. You ask God to save you, that'll, that'll, you know, send you to hell, and things like this. Somebody that says that is lost. Sorry. You know, I mean, one thing I'll, I'll say about Ruckman that I don't agree with is, I think he was a bit too liberal with, with just calling a lot of people saved that I don't believe were saved. Okay, and I understand why. I've been through this thing myself being in ministry, and you see so many people and they're just going off and you're going, okay, is this a carnal Christian or is this a false? Well, it's, you know, I don't want to just make it all about you have to believe what I believe. And, you know, I understand. You get into this weird position where people start treating you like you're some kind of cult leader or whatever else because you're saying that person's lost and this person's lost. And by the way, we're supposed to. Uh, if you think that um, you're not supposed to judge people, um, you're quite wrong, quite foolish. Uh, we are supposed to judge. I mean, that's part of our job. If you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ, um, doesn't an ambassador have some make some judgment calls? I would hope so. But uh, let's continue on here. So he says here, so prayer in and of itself doesn't save a man. Realizing this, a new group of heretics, hyper-dispensational heretics, in this case Bible-believing Baptists, in name only, have come up saying that if a man 
prays to get saved, or more specifically, prays the sinner's prayer, then he is lost. The idea behind this is that prayer is a work, and a man isn't saved by works, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. So all a man need do is assent to the fact that Christ died for him, and thank God for having already forgiven his sins. So this, uh, there's an individual that, that read this, and I won't name the name, but what he did is then he just went from here, and he went on to the next quote. Didn't read this. He wants you to believe all a man need do is assent to the fact that Christ died for him and thank God for already, having already forgiven his sins. See? Then he says, see? Ruckman agrees with me. Uh, no, keep reading. You know? Of course, there are all kinds of things wrong with that erroneous teaching. Not the least of which is that giving thanks to God for having already saved you is a prayer. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Now, brethren, as a prayer is a prayer whether you ask God to save you or you thank God for saving you. If prayer can't save you because it is a work, then for God's sake, as well as your own, don't thank God for saving you. In fact, you know, I would say, when should you pray at all? You know, really, because it could be misconstrued as a work in God's sight and you go to hell. It's ridiculous. You would be mixing works with your faith, then you wouldn't be saved, according to these wing nuts up here. That is the kind of nonsense being spread around uh, independent fundamental Bible-believing circles these days. In the community where, community where I pastor, it is being put out by a radio station whose call letters are WTGF. That station uses the fundamental broadcasting network as a lure to get Christians to listen to the local announcer talk them out of their salvation. That false doctrine is the result of pastors running into a bunch of shallow converts who have never grown in their Christian lives and are living like the world being unable or unwilling to get those folks back into church under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and not seeing many people saved under their ministries, those pastors turn on their congregations and try to retread them so that they can see some results. That is not sound doctrine, it is not evangelizing the lost, and it is not discipling those who have believed. <clears throat> it is confusing a bunch of, bunch of sheep to prove that the Holy Spirit is working in a church when He isn't. Amen. That doctrine destroys the assurance that a Christian should have about his salvation. After all, he thought he was saved before because he had trusted Christ, but the preacher convinced him that he had trusted Christ the wrong way. Well, if it can happen once, it can happen again. So the questions begin to flood into the retread's mind. What if I didn't believe enough? What if I didn't repent enough? What if I doubt my salvation even just a little? People in those kinds of churches end up getting saved three and four times. The only difference between a church like that and the Brownsville Revival is the Pentecostal, big Pentecostal meeting here is what he's talking about, is that the Brownsville Revival found a way to shovel the retreads through faster so they could report over a million saved. Now let's look at this matter not only from a scriptural point of view, but from a practical one as well. There is nothing in the scriptures, including here at Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13, that says you have to pray to get saved. There is no evidence that the Ethiopian eunuch prayed to get saved, even though he did confess with his mouth, Acts 8.37. As far, as long as you have a King James Bible, if you don't have it, then it's not in there. As far as we know, Cornelius and his household did not pray to get saved, Acts 10.43-47. through 47. Okay, let me just uh, stop there for just a minute. Let me just say this about what he's saying. Does the Bible say that he, that you know, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch there, that he, you know, prayed to get saved in Acts chapter 8? No, it doesn't say that. But you see... If you take this thing to a court of law, so to speak, um, from a legal standpoint, uh, the fact is the only way that you could really truly prove your case that he didn't pray is if you had an eyewitness to that whole thing. In other words, he might have prayed and it might not have been recorded. You could make that argument. Okay, so um, I understand, again, you have to say those things. I'm not disagreeing with Ruckman for putting that in there, you know, he has to say that because if you don't, then the then these you know wicked hyper dispensational bathlicks will come along and they'll say, "What about the Ethiopian eunuch? What about you know this and what about that?" They'll do that. Okay, there are certain people that there's no record of them. It wasn't recorded that they prayed to get saved. That's true, but that doesn't mean you throw out prayer. You stick with the context of Romans chapter ten, which clearly, clearly, crystal clear teaches that you're to pray, calling upon the name of the Lord. Let's continue. 
At the same time, though, you can't say it is wrong to pray to get saved. The so-called sinner's prayer finds its origin in Luke 18.13 in a parable told by Jesus Christ. The publican who prayed that prayer went home justified. What Luke 18, verse 14. What made the prayer efficacious to the publican was the person to whom he addressed the prayer. Luke 18, verse 11, there of, uh, you know, what he was praying there in 18, 13. The spirit in which he prayed, humble repentance, and that for which he prayed, God's mercy to a sinner. To that prayer Christians have added, and save me for Jesus' sake, fulfilling Romans 10, 9 through 13. If any sinner prays that prayer or a similar one, expressing the belief that he is in his heart, that he, excuse me, expressing the belief he has in his heart on the Lord uh, Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, do you really think the Lord is going to reject an act of faith in Jesus Christ expressed through prayer after he said, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out? John 6, 37. And let me just interject a little thought here. How do you come to Jesus Christ? just in your mind? Um, how do you get in contact with the Lord? Talk to Him. <laughs> you know, something to think about there. Now, if prayer is a form of calling upon the name of the Lord, and it certainly is, then if a man confesses his faith in Jesus Christ to God in prayer, then he is saved. He might not have to do it just that way, but if he does, he isn't working his way to heaven. After all, it isn't his prayer that saves him anyway, it is Jesus Christ that saves him. Yeah, good point. But Jesus Christ saves the sinner when he places his faith in him, and the same Lord who told the sinner to believe also told him to confess him with the mouth and call upon his name. You can do both in prayer. Simple. I mean, this stuff is just, you know, anybody can read, can just read the Bible and see what it says. Practically speaking, it is good for a sinner to pray when he gets saved. Nobody alive remembers when he was born physically, but most people have a birth certificate that tells them when they were born and where excuse me, where they were born and when they were born. When a man prays to get saved, that gives him a tangible time to which he can point and say, that's the time and place where I placed my faith in Jesus Christ and was saved. It can strengthen the Christian's assurance. The second thing that comes up is what if a man doesn't confess Christ when he gets saved? What you have here is a general rule. The verse is constructed in a way similar uh, to Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Obviously, in that passage, uh, salvation is conditioned on belief, not belief, and baptism. But if a man is saved by belief in the gospel, Mark 16, 15, then as a general, general rule, he will be baptized. The exceptions to that uh, doesn't overthrow the rule. They prove the rule. Generally speaking, when a man receives Christ into his heart, it will come out of his mouth. Of course, the rule isn't foolproof. In John 12, 42, there are a bunch of chief rulers that believed on Christ, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. When Jesus Christ addressed these men in John 12, 44 through 50, he addressed their belief, not their lack of confession. He made it very clear that it was their belief that saved them. Were they cowards? Yes. Did they love the wrong thing? Yes. Were they lost? Not on your life, brother. Joseph of Arimathea was among that group, and eventually he came forward and confessed Jesus Christ. John 19, verse 38. Nicodemus was in that group, and he came out for Jesus Christ too. John 19, 39. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 7, we discover that a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So generally speaking, a saved man will confess Jesus Christ to others. But as I said in the discussion on prayer, there is no set way like prayer that you, that you do it. When a baby gets hungry, he cries to let someone know. When a sinner makes up his mind that he needs to get saved, he will call upon the name of the Lord. And if a saved sinner never walks the aisle, gets baptized, or joins the church, the Lord will put him in a situation where at some point that old boy will speak up and confess Jesus Christ. I had a preaching buddy when I attended Bob Jones University named Chuck Throckmorton. Uh, before he came to BGA, BJU, he was in the Merchant Marines. He had a Christian mama who prayed for him every day when he was out at sea. When he was an unsaved sailor, his ship was in the Persian Gulf at the end of World War II. It was during a hot summer night, and he was, about, he was on duty on, in the boiler room. The temperature was about 130 degrees. The boilers were clanging and banging, and he had sweated until he couldn't sweat anymore. All the hatches to the upper decks were open, and he looked up through the three decks and saw the stars twinkling in the night sky. As he stood there in that hot boiler room looking up at the stars which seemed just out of 
his reach, it suddenly occurred to him, hell must be like this. Then he dropped to his knees there on an iron mat and got saved. When he finally got off watch, he ran up to his hammock, got out his sea bag, and pulled out a Bible which his mother had given to him before he had shipped, shipped out. Like so many new Christians, he did not know where to start reading. So he let the Bible fall open and placed his finger down on a verse. He hit Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. When he read that, he ran up onto the bridge and into the pilot house just as the captain had come on duty. That is something you just don't do. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. He then grabbed that captain by the coat and shook him and said, I want to confess Jesus Christ to you. You can't say that I didn't confess him, because I did. You're a witness that I just confessed him to you right now. <laughs> of course, the captain thought he was crazy. He cussed Thor Throckmorton out and had the boatswain's mate physically remove him from the bridge. When that ship arrived at a U.S. port, old Chuck was given a Section 8 and thrown out of the Merchant Marines. That was a situation where, when God showed a new Christian to confess him, that babe in Christ took the Lord seriously. He ended up being a great soul winner and a fine pastor. Verse 12 simply defines the whoever or whosoever of verse 13. Whosoever does not mean the elect, it means whatever Jew or Gentile that called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? And of course, you know, they'll do the thing. They'll say, well, then verse 14 debunks your thing. How then shall they call on whom, him, him in whom they have not believed? So they say, see, the believe is what saved, and then they call on you after that. And like Ruckman said in the commentary there, well, why pray, you know, and thank him for saving you? That's, you're still praying. <laughs> kind of a weird situation there. And, you know, if you look at verse 13, it plainly says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling comes before salvation. All right. So, you know, this, this whole debate that certain people bring up, um, this whole thing, it's all about to just distort and confuse your mind. Um, the only reason I've ever questioned people's salvation in my studies is because I know that there are many, many false converts out there, um, as I once was. I had no idea what I was doing. You know, again, let me share my testimony real quickly. Uh, back when I was eight years old, Sunday school, they said, you know, they did this thing in the sinner's prayer and the whole deal. And, and um, if you don't want to go to hell when you die, you know, and, and all, you know, the children are all raising their hands, you know, and I was taken out into the hallway. Joyce Laycock was my Sunday school teacher, Calvary Monument, ba Con you know, not Baptist, Calvary Monument Bible Church um, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And um, taken out in the hallway, I kneeled down and I prayed this prayer and I was like, hey, I'm a Christian. This is great. And then throughout my teenage years, I was a uh, got into pornography up into my twenties and things, and and uh, and you know all kinds of wickedness and things, profanity, and listening to all kinds of satanic heavy metal and uh, adrenaline junkie and the whole deal. I wasn't saved. Are you kidding me? I made fun of the Bible, but I had prayed the prayer way back when in Sunday school. See, it's false conversion. And it wasn't until I realized, wait a second here, I'm a sinner. And it was just like my whole life, I'm, I'm, I was an up-and-coming artist at, the, at that point in time. I was getting into better galleries and better art shows and things. And, and I'm just like, I just started losing this, my desire for it. And I'm going, what on earth is going on here? You know, and, but I'm looking at the world and I'm going, there's things happening I can't explain. I'm starting to get a little bit scared here. Um, this is kind of weird. And I remember uh, one time I walked out of my art studio at night. I was, I was out there till like 3 o'clock in the morning working and, and whatever else and I looked up at the stars similar to the way that guy did that uh, Ruckman talked about and it was just like I just said God if you're up there I need to know the truth I want wisdom I didn't know you know I thought I was saved at that point and uh, boy I started studying you know Bible prophecy and things like that and I started to read the Bible and I'm like you know what this book is so foreign to me I can't relate to this book at all I don't I don't even understand what it's like to what these people went through and everything, and I, I don't get it. And I started to get that fear, like, I don't think I'm saved. Yeah, well, I prayed the prayer, and I'm like, I don't think it took, you know? And I, for the first time, I got to that point where I was like, you know what? I'm wicked. I'm not a good person. I'm a sinner. 
the stuff I've done in my past, and you know, and I'd try to give up pornography and things like that, you know, and other addictions and things that I had, and it just wouldn't work. And it was just like, I, I can't go on like this. I need to be saved. And I remember I got down on my knees, and I put, I mean, my face is on the, on the floor, and I'm just like, God, and I start crying. I'm like, God, please save me. Please, Lord, you got to save me. I don't want to go to hell. I, I'm, I know I'm going to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. You know, I called upon his name. I asked him to save me. And you're wicked out there if you're telling me I never got saved because I called upon his name. So, well, that's all you did, you know. No, I had a belief in my heart. And that belief led me to call upon him to be saved. God is the one that saves you. You know, this whole thing, prayer is a work. It's, it's a work that man does to be saved. What about belief? I could say the same exact argument for belief. See, belief is a figment of your imagination. There are children that believe in the tooth fairy, children that believe in Santa Claus. Does that mean Santa Claus exists because of the child's belief? Of course not. You can't believe your way into salvation. God has to save you. And he spelled it out just as plain as day. Okay? Believe what he did. Faith in the gospel. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And then call upon him. Ask him. Talk to him. Why is that so strange for people? I don't, I don't get that. I really don't. You know? I mean, I just, I don't, I, I can't fathom that. Why somebody would understand this issue and just go, nope, sorry. I refuse to pray. I refuse to ask God to save me. I will not do it. It is my belief. I believe, and that's all I need. I'm not asking Him for anything. Until after I've saved, I'm saved, you know, by my own belief, you know, and then I'll start praying to Him. You know, it's disgusting. So, there you go. You actually saw the whole thing, not just a few little highlighted little portions and selected little things, and we'll just ignore the rest. You know, it, it perturbs me to have to come out and expose people. You know, some people think I enjoy this. I don't enjoy this, all right? But what I see over and over again is myself and other ministries out there that are trying to get the word out and trying to get people and, and saved and things like this and trying to get Bibles to them and teach them about things and whatever else. And these little stinking false prophets coming along all the time and just, just putting doubts in people's minds and stuff. And they're going, oh, I don't know. I, I cannot tell you how many people have left this ministry because they start listening to some false prophet out there. Puts doubts and questions in their minds. And, they, and then they, they put the doubts in first and then they start to just stab me to death. You know, Denlinger's a heretic. Denlinger's of this. Denlinger's of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, they're they're gone. They're off in some other direction. You know, like I said in my other thing about the three purposes of ministry: evangelizing the lost, feeding the saved, you know, feeding the flock of God, and exposing false prophets. Those are the three purposes of a man in ministry. Okay, any Christian ministry really, but when you're in full-time ministry as I am, those are the three parts of it. And it's a it's it's a grief to have to expose people. It really is. I mean, there are some people that are just so wicked and so foolish and whatever. You'll hear me laugh and things because it just gets so ridiculous after a while. I mean, some of the stuff people come up with, I'm just going like, what? What are you talking about? But uh, this whole thing is just, it's just absurd. So you've seen what Ruckman said. You've seen that what he says agrees with people should pray. All right? And you come up with all these little philosophical little, but what about, blah, 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 what if somebody's deaf and dumb? What if, blah, 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 blah. just go someplace else, all right? So that is going to be it. The um, uh, Lord's really been showing us a lot of things here. Um, there's another video I'm going to be coming out with here because one of you actually posted this in the comments section. I'm going to have to expose somebody else because I've recommended them in the past and it's just like, <sighs> But it has to be done. Again, you know, uh, what would what would it say about my character as a preacher if people know that I'm covering up for false doctrine and things like that within the system of Bible believing, King James Bible believing Christianity, and I'm just keep my mouth shut and I just cover things up and just sweep things under the rug? What's that say about my character? 
I will warn people, and I think if you know about this ministry, you know what's going on. You know who I'm talking about in this video. I'm just being sarcastic. But, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. So, that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.